Fred Film Radio, I'm David Martos. This is the 78th edition of the Mostra de Venezia, and we're here with John Albert, director of Life of Crime, which is out of competition here. John, thank you very much for being with us today. Hi, David. Thank you. This is the first time I've ever had an interview when they put you in the rocking chairs. And normally, like as filmmakers, you don't let people go into rocking chairs because they <laughs> start moving back and forth. They're and not you in, can't focus, keep in focus, right? Yes, so, so this is very comfortable. But, but isn't it unusual. nice? It is, you know, it, it's sort of... I th I might, you know, you have to ask the questions quickly because you know, pretty <laughs> soon I'm going to start. <laughs> <laughs> so, when did you know this material you shot, you've been, you've been shooting for, for decades, was going to end up being a documentary? I didn't know it right away. We, we, we had no intention of making a documentary. This was actually going to be on the, the morning program in the United States, the Today Show. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'd done a series of, of uh, short reports about uh, alternative programs that would take young criminals and like move them away from criminal behavior. So uh, one, they would take them out to the desert and they would like drop them off in the desert and see if they could survive for two weeks. And after two weeks, they, they, um, the, the results were better than if they just kept them in prison. Uh, we, we run a program ourselves uh, that's actually very um, successful. We started in 1978 in which we teach young people to be filmmakers. Um, this year for the first time um, ever, high school students had a documentary on a major broadcaster. Mm. The film was on HBO about surviving COVID. 100% uh, of our kids go to college. But you know, I, my motorcycle is back in 1984, my motorcycle had just been stolen. Uh, somebody else I worked with, apartment, broken into. Uh, it was a big crime wave going across New York City. Who are these criminals? Why are they doing this? And so we started out just trying to understand who was committing the crimes and why they would commit them. And this was going to be a short report on the Today Show, but we met uh, Rob, Freddie, and Delirious, and the first day we completely unprepared were with them in a department store as they were stealing things and we were filming it. And if we would have told the story just for that morning program, it would have been superficial and sensational. And so we, we basically knew that we would have to follow them longer. And we made one program, we made a second program, and then you know, we stopped. Because mm -hmm. we didn't want to make the same program again. Both had sort of bad endings where everybody was uh, drug addicted or in jail. Yeah. yeah. And so we started the filming again when I got a phone call from Delirious. Delirious is uh, the main star of the film. Rob and Freddie had died. We had gotten depressed. We quit, said this project, we don't want to work on this anymore. It's too sad. And then Delirious called and said, John is Delirious, and we thought she was dead. And um, she said, I'm not dead, John. I've been drug free for four <laughs> years, and um, I want you to come with your camera because this is the story I want to tell. And we said, Yes, and we want to tell that story too. Of course. So that was the intention of the ending of this whole process, this entire 36 years, was to show this triumphant moment for Delirious. The mayor was going to recognize her, give her the keys to the city. Mm -hmm. We're going to have mm -hmm. a parade through town. And I don't know what happened here in Italy, but in the United States during the pandemic, everybody who needed support services like Delirious, mm -hmm. those services disappeared. So she didn't have meetings to go to. She didn't have a psychologist. She didn't have a group that she could be part of. And she lasted through most of the pandemic, but she didn't make it to the end. That's uh, a bit. And if we would have known that that was the ending, we wouldn't have finished the film. Okay. And from the point of view of a filmmaker, is it better to keep a distance with the subjects of your documentary? Or is it better to, I mean, to develop a relationship with them like so, you did? Because it, 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 it uh, came along with the project, I know, but... Um, so every, what listen, do you think? everybody's different. And so I don't think that there is a general rule. There are some filmmakers who do very well by stepping back or okay. pretending to step back you know the truffle hunters mm -hmm, okay mm -hmm. so the conceit of that film is the camera located across the room no interaction with the filmmaker um film was very well received i can't make a film like that okay i want to pet the dogs i want to drink wine with the guys <laughs> i want to basically have the camera be so intimate um that you feel like you're there 
participating more than observing. And so there's different styles. And Truffle Hunters was a good film, but I wouldn't make it that way, and they wouldn't, they, they wouldn't and couldn't make the film the way we do. I know. This was a short but nice interview with John Alpert, director of Life of Crime. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Much appreciated. Thanks. Thank you. This is Fred, the Festival Insider.